Hello again, and welcome back to another special episode of An Aesthetic Education. I am pleased, delighted, some might say, to welcome to the show Lisa Ledson. Lisa is an artist based in Napa, California. So we're bringing in some representation from the West Coast and from California for, you know, we got to represent the home states while we can, uh, who works primarily in the realm of abstract paintings. Throughout Lisa's work, there is a strong sense of vibrancy and movement that displays a depth of thought and meaning that highlights the complex emotional and aesthetic elements of the creative process. I am sure that we're going to explore this and much, much more in our discussion today. But uh, Lisa, welcome again. And uh, thank you for joining me. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So we like to start these conversations as I as I try to remind people just with, you know, this is our one Freud moment where, you know, imagine you're on the couch and you're trying to recall your earliest memories. So, you know, in Napa, growing up in, in Northern California, a beautiful part of the world, where did your love of art, love of creativity kind of come from? That's a really great question. So my um, entrance into the art world is very unique in that I never thought about being a painter as a young person. Um, I was brought up in the performing arts. And so you could say that that's like influenced the kind of work I create and how I create. Um, I was a classical ballerina from the age of three to 18 and had just a very disciplined childhood Um really during my early years, but I only, you know, it only occurred to me to start painting about six years ago when I went through a kind of crazy um, downturn in my personal life. And uh, essentially I had to call off a wedding two months before the wedding and it left me sort of reeling emotionally and struggling to move through some pretty difficult emotions. And I had the impulse to go to the art store and uh, just to sort of like find something healthy to get work through what I was dealing with emotionally. So I told my mom, I said, hey, mom, can we can you come with me, you know, go to the art store and can we just grab some some things so that I can like, you know, at three in the morning when I can't sleep, uh, have something to do. And so she's like, absolutely. So we went to the art store locally and she's like, OK, the first five hundred dollars are on me. And she actually went to art school. So for her, she understood, she knew, you know, everything about the supplies. And I'd only painted with watercolors as a child at Walt. So I asked her about oils and she was telling me how they're flammable and everything. And I'm like, okay, forget that. Let's, mm -hmm. let's do this other. <laughs> so I grabbed a bunch of acrylics and that night at three in the morning when I couldn't sleep, you know, I was in my kitchen in my bathrobe listening mm. to music, uh, just thinking about how depressed I was. And I pulled up, you know, a pad of paper from the art store and some red and black and acrylic and uh, this little tool called like a palette knife that I'd never used. And I just, you know, threw it down on paper and went like that with the, the palette knife. And I that next morning at like seven in the morning posted on my Instagram account. Um, at the time I only had like 300 followers. I had a private account and a really big art collector reached out to me like 30 minutes later. And he said, is this available? Mm -hmm. and, and I said, yeah, <laughs> he's like, well, how much is it? And so I called my mom. I'm like, mom, you're not going to believe this. This big art collector wants to buy this painting I made last night. And he go and my mom goes, Oh my God, that's amazing. I go, you know, what do I, he wants to know how much of it. I knew nothing. About it, okay. So she said, I just said, pick a number, throw out a number. And she said, um, 800. So I go back to the guy and I, I said, a thousand thinking we would negotiate down. And he's like, sold. So that production to the art world. Um, wow. so back to your question. It never, I never had the desire to paint. I, you know, I painted, I went to a very, um, a pretty special private school growing up that focused mm -hmm. a lot on the, got really great grades and arts, but um, it never occurred to me to create. And until I had something kind of terrible happen in my life. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I find that really interesting. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm coming at it. I, you said because you, you went to Waldorf, and I'm a former English teacher, so I kind of know a bit about Waldorf and and their you know um, practices and and their teaching methodologies and things like that. So it is a very it's a very focused on that kind of naturalist you know creative environment. And I know they push the arts, so I find it a bit interesting in a way that even though you had that kind of creative outlet, it wasn't really a thought or consideration until much much later. It wasn't, and you know I've heard this from some artists that like they had to go through something really tragic in order for them to feel a desire to create, like to have something to say. I never had the desire. I mean, I was, I was good at art and I got great grades in it. Um, but it, like a lot of artists where like you can do it, but you, you don't have anything to say. That was me. I fell into that boat where I needed something really difficult to almost happen to me that sort of like, crack me open. And then all of a sudden, after this, this experience I had in my personal life, I it was like, I it was like turning on a faucet for me. Mm. Felt like I was just obsessed, like I had to create constantly. And yeah. so I mean, no one was telling me to create no one was saying how to create I just started making things um, in my little place in Napa Valley. And things, you know, a couple of weeks later, a huge art gallery reached out to me and said, do you have a portfolio? Who represents you? Mm. Um, which is just crazy. And there was just one thing after another. It was like huge art collectors were reaching out, asking to buy work. And it all just happened really organically, uh, which is why I say my story is, you know, it's different. <laughs> yeah. Sure. No, it is. So, I mean, I think what I find fascinating in a way is also the kind of the idea of just how, as you say, just how quickly it kind of happened. So, and this sort of leads into to my next question, which is considering this was your first kind of, you know, foray into art painting on any sort of level, you know, what was the style? Like, what were you creating at that point that was sort of attracted this interest kind of immediately that people hadn't really, they got excited about that they hadn't really seen before? Like, what was it exactly that you were kind of making that got that that interest? So, I mean, it was such an organic experience for me. When I went to the art store, I just grabbed a bunch of acrylics, um, inks, alcohol inks, and went home and just started experimenting in the most raw organic way. And so I think because I didn't come from a background, you know, from training or art school, mm. it was so emotional and so organic, it resonated with a lot of people. Um, because I had zero expectation even of anyone buying it. I wasn't even thinking that, you know. And I also wasn't concerned with anyone liking what I was creating, which is an incredible thing to to have. Mm. Most people that are creating are hyper aware of what they're making and feel this, you know, pressure to create something that will sell or that people will like, or that is worthy of X, Y, and Z. And because I never occurred to me to actually be an artist, like I wasn't, I didn't care. I was just yeah. literally a way to kind of move through some difficult emotions. And so I was doing a lot of, a lot of, um, you could say like action painting, so the work, the artists of like the 50s and 60s of, you know, the American abstract painters, I connect a lot. That kind of just really raw, emotional um, type of painting resonates with me very much. And even though now I'm, I've started pivoting into oils, you know, it is a, a different medium. You're not pouring it, but you can still see a lot of the same kind of raw emotional brushwork um in my oils as well yeah i i mean i having obviously looked at your work you know pretty thoroughly at this point and and having two pieces myself i think that's that's very clear right it's there's definitely that sense of like what you know pollock was doing and, and joan mitchell and and all those people that kind of came out of the post-war world where they were really trying to not remove what was done before but to evolve from it right and i find it really interesting in the sense that your style kind of you know building off of the back of them was able to find that space really quickly which is mm -hmm. which is really cool but then i think as you say right now you're moving into other mediums so 
how has that kind of evolved, right? I mean, thinking about form, thinking about subject matter, right? You're not dealing necessarily with the same emotions that you were on that first night. So what is it? What's the next step that's been happening over these last five years or so? Yeah. You know, it's been really interesting because with, you know, the success I've had, like I, I went from zero to a hundred in my career. So I signed with an, my first art gallery, you know, within months, had my first solo show a year later, first group show with Shepard Ferry in LA and artists from the Whitney Museum. A few months later, I was named a top emerging artist that year. And it's just been a crazy trajectory. Um, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't pressure to figure out on an intellectual level, my direction to like, you know, find a lane and stick in it. And I, you know, heard from a lot of people in the art world that like, that's what you should do. You got to find a style, find a medium and just do that one thing. But one thing that is at like, you know, a pillar of my career is to always listen to my intuition. And my intuition has always said just to naturally allow myself the space now more than ever, because I'm really still in the first 10 years of my career. So now is the time to find my voice, to find my style. And so you can see, you know, people that are seasoned art collectors can see patterns in a lot of my work, even though I jumped around and and tried different things. So, you know, you can see some of the the same style of brushwork and um, you know, some of the kind of action painting that I started doing early on, even with the oils. Um, I think because of my ballet background and I also have a um am a recommended black a black belt and ballerina uh, movement is an intrinsic part of my art and you see that a lot. Like I'm a very physical, visceral person. Mm. So um, you know, with Aside from the series like Little Hands, which is my my first series, you know, that's the art, the two paintings you have, that is an abstract figurative series. You know, the other work that I'm really focusing on are like my new oils, which are, you know, more pure abstract. Um, and I'd like to continue to do that kind of work, but on a larger scale. I've done mostly like up to like four by sixes, but I'd like to start getting a lot bigger because it allows you to you know move your arms even bigger and the body and really get physically more involved in the paintings themselves yeah i think um well i think that's one of the other things that's also really interesting is just you actually have a very diverse size arrangement that you offer with a lot of your works which many artists kind of don't they stick with one whether it's you know something like a 24 by 36 or or whatever and and they're like i need this much space and this is how much i want and this is how much i'm always going to to have but i think having range and sort of that diversity it makes it also more exciting for collectors because not everybody has room for a massive piece or is really looking for something like that they kind of like smaller more you know um mm -hmm. delicate almost uh, yeah. pieces that kind of you know speak to something but don't overwhelm something yeah. um and i think that's so like do you do you actively think about that like when you approach your gallery you know are they like telling you certain things about what they want what they need from you or are you kind of given free reign to do whatever you want at that point um my, you know my galleries have been amazing and that they've given me so much free reign to do what i want but I'm someone that also am like, I'm very curious as to like, what are their collectors drawn to out of my work? Mm. The majority of the work of mine that sells through my galleries are my larger. Pieces, so they're over mm. 30 sixes. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's majority of what I'm bringing in for them. Um, now the series, little hands, the abstract figurative series at least for now, I feel strongly that like that, that style and that series in particular looks better on a small scale. Yeah. Um, and to your point, a lot of people, even big collectors, like, you know, they, they'll see a piece, but it just works better in a smaller scale and they have an idea of where they want to put it. So you can't get too like caught up on that. Um, and, and some people just honestly don't have the space for like like a lot of my european collectors yeah you know they don't have the space <laughs> no no they They're, definitely don't totally different 
Yeah. So it's a real thing, you know? Yeah. Um, I really like to create work that people connect with and people feel um, sentimental about and, and just, you know, it, it brings some sunshine to their lives. So for me, you know, making it my art um, accessible to people, whether that means like, you know, creating a series that's a smaller scale and a, and a price point that is maybe more palatable is really, it feels good for me because it, I get so much joy out of other people connecting with the work and, you know, feeling excited about hanging it on their wall. Yeah. I, I, I find it really, it's an interesting dynamic these days in terms of how an artist has to look both obviously at the financials and at the creative, right? And that balance is always, you know, you want to hit both obviously, but at the same time, at one point you're going to have to make a decision. And I find it concerning, I guess, that the market forces usually one thing or another. And as you said, uh, you had recommendations from from people to kind of figure out your style, stick in your lane, and that's and that's it. And mm -hmm. to me, that seems completely the opposite of the whole point of creating art because it should always be evolving. It should always be changing. And the greatest artists are not the same. Like, you know, Picasso's style was not Picasso's style. Um, you know, it took him years to reach that point and everything that he did up to that was part of that journey. So to say that to somebody is like mind boggling to me, honestly. Couldn't agree more. And I feel like the people that do tell me that are really, I mean, they mean well, obviously, sure. um, personally by any means, but they are mm -hmm. outside of the creative process. And so they don't understand that I'm not thinking in terms of success within a year or six months, I'm looking at my entire career. And to your point, uh, you know, Picasso, every series and every season of his creative life led him to where, you know, he needed to be. And they all, all those styles contributed to mm -hmm. the, you know, evolution. And so that's how I see my creative journey is that I, I describe it to people as like, with every series, there's sort of like rivers that are all merging into coming into the ocean, like arteries that are all coming into the ocean. And it'll eventually, you know, when you look at it from a bird's eye view, make more sense. Yeah. I wonder if, I mean, have you ever considered working like, so you've done group shows, which is, which is great. Um, they've ever worked with other artists on, on projects or, you know, maybe not one piece necessarily together, but a series kind of, of ideas together or something like that? You know, that's a great question. I have yet to do that, but I've had artists ask me to collaborate with them. And I love like the collaborative experience of creating a commission with say a collector like where they're giving me feedback and we're discussing a piece and the meaning and what they like and how they where they think of hanging the painting and so because otherwise you know I'm creating on my own I'm in my head all day and so just to have that human interaction and to bounce ideas off someone else um but to be honest I because I create intuitively you know it's an emotional intuitive experience um, whatever people have asked me to collaborate with them, I sort of, I sort of like have a hard time envisioning how that would happen. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm open to it. So I don't know, maybe like something will come about that all, um, it'll just click and it'll make sense. But so far I haven't done it, you know, but you yeah. know, I, 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 I think what I, what I wonder about always with that is, and this is a topic that's come up in in the other conversations I've had on this on the show with other artists is the difference in the modern art world in terms of collaboration versus what it used to be, right? So you used to have these art movements that people would come together, whether it was like the Blue Rider group or the secessionists in Vienna or, you know, uh, some of the expressionists, uh, German expressionists and, and people like that. Um, or even back to like the pre-Raphaelites with the with the Brotherhood, you know, and they would work together, but they were still their own artists. They still had their own stuff. They had their own career, but they would either show together or just talk to each other, you know, collaborate sort of more holistically and bring about ideas and conversations. 
And I, Mike, I always wonder why that doesn't happen as much yeah. nowadays, you know? So I think, and I think to your point, it, what I find interesting about that is the fact that in many respects, it's also like how maybe it's presented, right? And if it's a collaboration for a specific point where it's kind of like hinting at more financial reasons to do it rather than artistic reasons, I totally understand that. At the same time, I'm also like, this is very frustrating that, you know, we don't have this kind of uh, culture of collaboration anymore in the art world in the same way as what it once was. I completely agree. And that's, I think it has maybe have been at least my impression. Mm. It was more commercial reasons. And, and that sometimes trips me up because yeah. I don't create in that way. Um, but you know, one thing that I am trying to sort of call more into my life is I would say, um, more of a community, the community artists and creators and like-minded creators um, that I can just relate to and talk to, you know, because I came into, I came into the business just like sprinting and I had no background. Um, that was one of the, you know, challenges early on was like, I didn't have anyone to call to ask, how do I wire up the back of a painting? Someone needs 20 paintings wired in a day and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> And exactly. Google was my best friend early on, you know, and yeah. YouTube, without those tools, I'd be screwed. Yeah. So I really would, um, you know, I'd like to spend more time in New York. That's kind of a goal of mine. And to try to tap into the creative community there. And, you know, maybe something is on the horizon for me in terms of collaboration. But I, I love what you said in terms of, you know, the history and how that used to be a big part of it. And I think it's just, I'm sure a lot of it comes back to like how in general where we have less community, you mm -hmm. know, society. Um, and it's something that nowadays, even though we're more connected than ever with technology, we're also not. We're also so individualistic in, in our approach. And I mean, I, and I'm guilty of that. So it's something that is sort of like, it's been in the back of my mind of like, okay, you need to put effort into connecting more with people. Mm -hmm creatives yeah it's it's one of those things where as you say it's definitely this age of technology is you know we're having this conversation we're on using the internet to have it and you know it's amazing that we can do that and and we've never had to meet in person you know to to get to this point which is which is truly unique in the scope of human history but it's it's also kind of you know that's a positive but then equally that's that's a downside is that you can't kind of make those direct connections in it's a it's a 10 step process, I should say, instead of like a, a two step process nowadays, you know, and uh, and I find that uh, disheartening, but at the same time, knowing that there's potential, at least in some right. areas to kind of bring that bring that together. And so I think, uh, you know, you just mentioned going to New York. So what are some of the places that you've gone to um, that have kind of inspired you? Um, you know, maybe helped you get over a roadblock uh, with your creativity or something like that. Both, you know, it could be a museum. It could be, I mean, it could be anywhere. So with roadblocks, the only time I, when I find myself kind of too much in my cerebral mind and, um, you know, maybe I'm, I'm dealing with something kind of stressful or annoying in my personal life. And so um, my mind, my nervous system is, so when I ever, whenever I've had a creative block, I put the brush down and I go into nature or I go meditate or I step away and I go kind of immerse myself into something in Napa that stimulates my other senses. Um, it's typically like roadblocks, like I said, are, are because my nervous system is sort of overactive or it's distracted. Mm. So when I get in front of the canvas, I feel like I'm forcing something. Um, another kind of little hack I have, uh, is to trick my, it's like a thing I started really early on. Although when I started, it was, it was, I, it wasn't even something I needed to trick my brain into doing because I actually felt it, but it's to say, I'm just this painting that I'm about to create right now is just for me. No one is going to see it. Um, I'm not showing it to anyone. This is like a journal entry that no one will read. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving myself permission to um, right here in this space to just be as 
weird, as emotional, as strange, as fucked up as whatever I need to be. And I'm not even going to worry about it. That's it. No one's going to see it. And really just think of that because what that does is sort of like shifts me out of the part of the brain that's like, oh, I need to create, uh, I need to make something that's good or something that someone's going to connect with. Um, and sometimes that helps just to kind of like move the energy. Yeah. I, I, I like that idea. I think, um, when you, I mean, finding peace in nature, right. Is, uh, I think most people do it in some form, uh, when they have that stress and and those different pieces, I I feel like what you actually just described is really akin to, and I know we sort of mentioned, I gave you a hint that we might talk about this beforehand, but um Rocco obviously he was a he was a genius and he dealt with a lot of inner demons on a variety of levels and so in his book which is he published he wrote it it's just like what you said a journal that he wrote about his philosophy on art um that he never intended to get published but obviously after he died his many many years later his children found it and they published it um it's fascinating and he kind of portrays that as the artist's dilemma um, right. Which is this sort of notion of like, you always have to, you're going to come up to a dilemma at some point in the creative process. And for every person that looks a little different, but how you overcome that dilemma is both unique to you and important to the next phase of your art. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like in some ways that's kind of what you've touched on. Right. Yeah. And it's again, back to like, I think one of our your earlier questions, I mentioned the pressure to create a certain type of painting or work for people that is i i think always going to be the challenge with as your work sells people want more of it they want to see more of it there's always this inherent pressure to create something that people want where the the way in which i created that work was by really separating myself mentally and emotionally from any expectation of what anyone else mm. so you that's why i say it's sort of like i have to trick myself because yeah i know that by creating something coming from that space <clears throat> chances are you know a collector is going to buy it and love it because it's raw and it's authentic and it's real but the way in which I go about it, I have to essentially tell myself that I'm really creating for me. That's it. I'm not one else. And I think it's from that energy, you know, which is also a, a type of confidence when mm -hmm. you're saying for me, I'm not doing this for you. I don't need your approval or validation. You're creating with a lot more strength and freedom. And that affects the brushstroke, it affects how you move, it affects your color choices, it affects the risks I take. You know, that's a big, I think, um, because I create from that place, I'm not afraid of taking risks. Like you, yeah. you see that, you know, for my stuff. And I'm, you know, there'll be days though, sometimes where I'll paint something and it's really just out there. And there'll be this little part of me is like, oh, this is too much or it's too mm. weird to do something. And right when that I hear that voice, that's when I know, no, share it, share it. And that's all that people connect with the most. Yeah. Do you think that, um, I guess, having the commercial element come to you so immediately had an impact on that? You mean in that it's, in what sense? In, in the sense that I guess that because like you had that commercial aspect of you, creating art and then getting it sold so quickly instead of just creating art and then leaving it alone yeah. um that that sort of gave you greater freedom or because i think some people would say oh that that like hamstrung that might have felt like it hamstrung me more as an individual but in your i feel like you're almost saying that it gave you kind of that push to be more courageous on a lot of fronts um i i mean my personality is one where i've always just been a really courageous person i don't know where i get it <laughs> so that's just like inherent in who I am. And I've always been that way. Like I've always mm -hmm. like the fences, but it is, it has been, you know, to your point, something that's come up quite a bit because like most people evolve, you know, they evolve, they have time from when they start, when it starts selling to when they get in their first gallery, their first show And mine happened 
so fast. It was overnight and people were expecting me to be able to talk about it and share about it. And I didn't even understand what I was creating. Like my gallery directors were explaining my work to me. So I don't even know if you can imagine that, but it's like you're up and you bring it in and the gallery directors are raving about it and they're comparing it to can mm. darkness. And I had, I had to write it down and go home and Google them because I had no mm. idea who they were. You know, I, in college, I think I studied classical art, but I didn't study any of the modern artists, contemporary artists. So I, you know, my experience has been so out there and different. Um, and I'm not immune to the psychological pressures, but what I've learned in the last six years is that so much of what I do is really just a mental game. Mm -hmm. It's being in that same mindset that I had when I first started painting. And I really didn't care what anyone thought about what I was doing, you know, because I didn't, like I said, I wasn't expecting to like become a professional painter and it happened overnight. I was making a ton of money and big collectors were pulling on me and galleries and asking me to, you know, all of a sudden have like an artist statement. And I'm like, I'm just making this in my kitchen. I don't, I don't <laughs> even. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's a balance and it's a, um, it's a discipline, I think a mental mm. discipline to, not let the pressures from collectors and galleries and shows um, weigh on me. And and like one quote, I actually don't even know who said it, but I, I read it years ago and I've always it's stuck in the forefront of my mind. And I think it's important for creatives to remember is, you know, to not take any of your successes or failures personally, mm. which allows you to sort of like separate yourself from the work, even though it's like the most personal thing a human can do is to like, or their soul onto a canvas and share it with people. Um, don't take it personally, whether someone likes it or not. Yeah, I feel yeah. I feel that that's great advice. Honestly, it's uh, not just for the creatives, but for for most people, right? <laughs> for one aspect or another. Do you think that, um, in a sense, you know, you came into this world? The art world is a unique place. It's a unique business model. Um, that to survive in, you have to know a lot of different skills. You have to understand financial management, but from a creative perspective, from an artistic perspective, it's totally different. Um, the way the art world operates with galleries, with representation, with art fairs, right, is, uh, I mean, it's a maze within a maze within a maze. So, I mean, that would have been very overwhelming. But like, my, I guess my real question is, is that how quickly did you kind of pick up on what was important and then versus the noise that accompanies all of that and and just sort of push that other stuff to to one side well so one of the things that um i am just insanely fortunate to sort of skills that i have beyond my creative skills is i so i'm actually very left brain right brain i'm ambidextrous i paint with both hands um it comes from my mom's side all the women on her side are and so I'm, because I'm left brain, I'm also pretty analytical. Um, even though I paint intuitively, I'm able to sort of like look at my work and study analytics, use social media technology in a way to sort of also from a commerce perspective, move the work. Um, and my background before art was I was in real estate. So I had, as an artist coming into it, I was super comfortable with contracts, writing, reading, editing contracts, um, sending invoices, negotiating, you know, pricing. And that, I mean, I didn't even, obviously it didn't occur to me when I got into it, that that would be like such a huge asset. But mm -hmm. as I, my career progressed, I realized, oh my God, I'm so lucky that I have this, um, the skill set, you know, and I'm comfortable mm -hmm. in, um, in this way, in terms of, you know, the business side of art, because I've, you know, a lot of artists that I've talked to that are incredible artists, so talented, mm -hmm. um, they struggle with that. And that's, um, they haven't been able to, you know, further their career, and they haven't been able to share their work or get it sold. And, so the business side of it has been a huge challenge for them. And, um, you know, it's always like been in the back of my mind of like one day, you know, further in my career when I'm not as crazy busy painting is like to somehow create 
like a platform, you know, or some kind of do some kind of philanthropy to help artists work through that and give them resources to get mm-hmm. out of the discomfort that they um or the the blocks that they have with dealing with selling the art and moving it and even just like having discussions with their galleries or with collectors about pricing and um kind of standing up for their own their own worth as well yeah it, it's one of those it's very overwhelming and i think most people who go into art school generally have no clue what they're they're getting into they get they get taught one thing and then the reality of of being an artist and the market and the way that it works is something totally different um as i said there's not many programs i went to i just completed my ma in at sotheby's in art business it's one of the few programs out there that actually focuses on the business side and it's yeah. uh, it's really interesting to see how um how different it is and how really business oriented you actually have to think about everything um and for our listeners we had david bellion who's the director of that program on a few weeks ago so if you haven't listened to that one i would recommend it because it gives a totally different insight into a lot of these questions and problems that have been uh plaguing the art world certainly in the modern in well actually always but in the modern form it's it's very different um yeah so yeah but i I mean you had a gallery obviously that kind of took you under their wing so what did they sort of how did they help you in that initial phase well so i was sharing all my work you know on social media and i wasn't really busy on social media before that i had a private Mm. account and so i um i would switch to a, a public account and people just organically started following me and i wasn't I wasn't trying to put out content. I mean, I wasn't even trying to put out, just sharing what I was doing. I wasn't even mm-hmm. thinking. Um, but I saw how people, what I was sharing and how I was sharing it, you know, it all has my sense of aesthetic, my sensibility on it. It's unique to me and people connected with that. But I, I've never really, like, I've never posted a picture of a painting with a price on it. Yeah, since I um so I've never been big on pushing the art in that way um but I've sold a ton of art on social media yeah. it happened organically and that's sort of been my style now everyone there's like the full spectrum if you look at social media and how people sell art some artists you know are one end and some are you know they literally have their prices right there in front of you and there's no right or wrong mm. it's just um I found for me sharing more organically uh was what made people connect and that was what ultimately inspired them to want to purchase it and i think nowadays with the market you know like last year being softer and galleries being slower that's more i mean it's so important to connect with people and think think of you know selling art as a way to connect with other people as opposed Mm. to yeah Uh, that's how you're going to move art. Mm. My- Do you think people, when they see your stuff on social media, because I always find this fascinating because, you know, so much of social media is this image that people have, whether it's real or whether it's not real. Um, mm. Do you think that there's a level of, you know, obviously I'd say you're, you're as you say, it's organic, it's quite authentic. Um, do you think that that's a bigger factor? Do they almost like you, your followers know you per se or is it more that they just know your artwork i think you know that's actually been you know it's a great question because i've had people in the business world um that thought that i should separate like my art account from personal Mm. and i've contemplated it you know in the past um there's pros and cons to it and it really is so dependent on the person it's different for every person because I found some challenges with sharing some of my personal life. And I thought, you know, do I just make this strictly art account? You know, how do I handle it? And in the end, I I feel like I've come to a place now that I'm happy with where I'm sharing some of my personal life and some of my creative process. But it's it's not, you know, I don't share anything that's going on in my romantic life or family you know it's still very curated and that and I'm, I'm very mindful of that just to maintain my own um like privacy mm. but i think 
for people when they're connecting with a painting, you know, they could buy a painting off a gazillion databases of art, you know, and marketplaces without having any idea of who's behind it. And one of the most incredible gifts that social media gives us is this vehicle to um, allow people to connect with the creator. And even if you're not talking to them or you're not sharing something that's super personal to you, even just a picture of, you know, me that morning having coffee, watching the sunrise and the way I took that picture, someone sees it and they go, oh, I love this person's sense of life or style or how they live or what they appreciate or, you know, I connect with that. And so that all of these things in a nuanced way help the consumer the person viewing your content connect with you in a way that they feel like mm. there are, you know, similarities and compatibility. And, and so again, to the point of um, focusing more on connection as opposed to transactions, that's where a tool and a platform like Instagram is like priceless. And the fact that we have this as, you know, in this day and age is incredible. Like we are just so lucky to be living in a time where mm. we, platform it's free to us you know to help connect with people yeah do you do you feel that um it's kind of changed the role of the artist in society yeah absolutely i mean again like i'm coming into the art world and i came into it in a different way and so my experience is unique but i feel in my experience that a lot of people are looking to artists and creatives in a way, in a good way that they, they respect them more than ever and they admire them and they want to know them or they, you know, like, I mean, I, my first solo show in Napa Valley when I started painting was sold out and like set records for the gallery because they'd never had such a huge turnout. They had standing outside and they had to, open the door so that people could at least hear my talk. And, and I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. It was because people flew Mm. in from country to hear me talk that were people that followed me on social media. Mm. Yeah. So they, you know, were watching my stories and thought, I really want to see this person talk. I don't know what it is about this person, but I want to connect with them. So Mm. all I'm sharing these like stupid little photos of like, you know, me Mm. driving, or you know something I'm making, people felt a deep connection to that to the point where they were willing to like get on a plane and fly across the country to see some little, you know. And I think that's incredible if you think about it. Mm. You know, so artists are, um, and I'm obviously not like I don't have a huge following on social media, but the following I do have is very loyal, and a lot of them, you know, own multiple paintings of mine and been following me almost from the beginning. Mm. Yeah. I think I find that I mean the whole follower thing and and social media in general I find it really mind warping in a lot of ways. Um, but as you say, I think like it depends on the community that you grow. To go back to that word that you used before, and how people interact with you. Um, I always felt that there was a little bit of a you know like when you lose the sense of mystery around an artist and around the creative process, then sometimes that lessens it a little bit. Um, yeah. but I think, uh, you know, maybe in your case, and I would say just following your own stuff, I, I don't think you break that barrier. So I feel yeah. like it's still, it's still a part of that journey. Yes. And it's, there's this part of me, like I've always been a pretty private person. So there's been times where I've brushed up against like a little bit of discomfort with sharing. And I mean, like I told you, this is my first podcast I've mm-hmm. done. No, I need to do it. It's something that people, they want to hear me talk. They want to hear me share. And I know that's a good thing. But um, I think because of like the early years of, you know, I started creating, I had some people that were pulling to kind of like wanting to know more about me as a person. Um, I've been a little protective over that. Like I am a little protective over my private life. And just because it's like, I don't, I don't need strangers, um, (laughs) things that I'm, you know, about the human and like, I want to keep it about the art. Mm. So it is, it is a dance and it's a balancing act to find where you're comfortable. And for everyone, like I said, it's different. And I totally 
my hat goes off to people that are like brushing their teeth mm-hmm. on the talking to their followers and they're super comfortable, you know, and I'm like, I, that's just not me. It's never going to be, yeah. me. you know, but, um, and that's their thing is like, just really being super like naked to the world. That's just not me. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So bouncing off of that, like we'll, we'll move away from social media. It's, you know, it's a weird place. It's a, it's, you know, they have funny ideas over there and all that stuff, but do you think, uh, you know, you said, you know, it's been a six year journey so far. So what's the next six years? What's like kind of the goal besides to, you know, get your stuff out there, get more people to see it, obviously get more collectors interested in it, but but sort of what's what's kind of the the ultimate goal here in terms of, you know, do you want to get into museums? Do you want to have more exhibitions? You know, things like that. So that's a great question. I just did my first um, big museum event, the Crocker Art Museum. I was asked to um, present work for their annual gala and the um, head of museum purchased my painting at their auction, which was like insane. I didn't never saw that coming and it was just an incredible experience. And so um, I, you know, moving forward, definitely want to work more with museums and have a couple that I've been talking to. Um, that I would like to do shows with. I also see myself moving into bigger markets like LA, New York, representation. Um, and I'm not in a rush to, I feel like that's just one of those things like, you know, your relationship with a gallery is is one that really has to be so mutual and <clears throat> beneficial for everyone. And so even though I've talked to some galleries in those markets, I've yet to decide on signing with one mm-hmm. uh, i do have i've been asked to do four let's see four shows in the next solo shows in the next like 12 to 18 months and we're still in negotiation and talks as to like dates so i'm not in a rush right now to like pump out those shows just because last year was a slow year for everybody mm-hmm. and yeah out of that and so i would rather push those shows to the second part of 2024 and maybe into 2025 um just to allow like the economy in the states to come back a bit you know and i mean that's like what i've learned is like don't rush it even though like it's easy to be like oh my god i just want to do it now and da, 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 da. no it's a marathon not a sprint and you're gonna yeah. just it's gonna be so much better if you do take your time you're consistent you're relaxed and you're calm about it and don't um, buy into any pressure or frenzy around like you have to be pumping out shows all the time to be relevant. I disagree. Like, yeah, yeah, chill out and um, focus on the work. If the work's good, like people will always find you and it's all happen. Yeah, it's that's 100 percent true. I think you got to you can't force the creative that's 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 the key thing yeah exactly and that's you know when i have like younger artists talk to me and ask me questions like that's what i really push and it's like really try to protect your creative process and get more and more into that and almost like put blinders on to as you and it's hard because as you're selling more and you're asked to do more shows and projects of course it's natural as a human to start focusing out here outside Mm -hmm. of your out of the process and so the job of the artist is to like put blinders onto that and pretend like none of that's happening and just stay true to your your process and who you are yeah it's a great thought and i think super important so i think we're almost we're going to be almost at the end but i want to do our kind of quick fire quick fire questions our last three and then we'll hopefully you know we'll end that this will have inspired some people uh and i'm sure it will have with uh you know that it doesn't matter when you when you come to art at some point, uh, success is possible, and most importantly, it's enjoyable um, along the way as well. So, let's start with the first one, which is any artist, alive or dead, that you would want to have seen work in person. Oh gosh, probably de Kooning. Whenever I visit art. Um you know, at museums, it's, there's just something about it. And it's not a technical thing. It's something about the energy of it. And I would have loved to like spend time with him as a human, 
to see how his personality um, played into what he was creating and how he was creating. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's he was one that was, uh, I mean, obviously such a insightful thinker about his own style, which was, I think, quite rare. And as somebody who could like actively talk about all the different elements, which not every artist is capable of uh, of doing. So, yeah. yeah, really, really cool. Great. So then, if you could only work with one medium for the rest of your life, permanently, oh. you're stuck on a desert island somewhere, and this is all you got. It would be oils, like I off doing oils my mom telling me they were flammable like got in my head off that why people are working <laughs> and you know painting and you know acrylics are like speed painting now that i have started working in oils that you compare the two that you can't even compare them but when i it was about four or five months ago i was like oh my god the colors that you get and the richness i felt like the paintings were painting themselves because you just you can't achieve that with acrylics um completely different animal of course because you're having to wait so long in between layers so that is mm. something that, yet i'm still you know obviously learning about them and playing with them and getting to know how to use them and manipulate them but um i definitely it was exciting for me about five months ago when i started painting them because i was like oh finally something i can stick with and not get bored in because I would paint something with acrylics and it was like, okay, that's cool. But I couldn't take it deeper or further. Um, it wasn't, it was like too much on the surface or the, the colors weren't mm. blended. That, whereas with oils, it's like this feeling of getting like lost in the colors and lo and pulled in where I, I like start painting in them. And it's like, before I know it, hours have gone by and I'm like, whoa, it's like, I just get, um, Hold into the medium yeah i think well that you know for when you're stranded on your your desert island that would be a, a good thing to keep you entertained for sure instead of just one acrylic one color and you're trying to paint with like a, a palm tree or something you know um okay on the serious note but like lastly and probably the most important question because you know to all of our audience who i'm sure will after this go to your website and go to your socials and everything like that um what is the feeling that you kind of want people to to leave with after they see one of your works mm, oh gosh that's a great question um i want them to feel um in looking at my art that they feel a connection around some emotion, some human emotion, whether that's pain or happiness or, you know, like my little hand series is like the most whimsical series I've done. And what I love about it is how people um, connect around those emotion of emotions of, you know, whimsy and delight and play and joy and like these very human experiences that we have between children or adults or memories from childhood. Um, so I want people to feel, I guess you could say like seen or visible or understood in their emotions. I love it. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. That was a fascinating conversation. I'm so happy that we could do this. I'm so happy that we could represent California to the yeah. wider art world because sometimes we get forgotten over here on the west coast a little bit but uh really it was it was truly amazing and and i will make sure to put all your descriptions all your links right everything that you need to to go look at lisa's work in the bottom of this little you know wherever whatever viewing platform you're using for this podcast um but thank you again um i really really appreciate it it's such an honor and thank you so much it's been awesome this show please give us a follow on your preferred podcast listening platform this episode is available on spotify apple podcasts and youtube you can also follow us on instagram or facebook where you can find us under altalena.art a link to this week's podcast can also be found on our website altalena.art forward slash aesthetic education if you are interested in seeing more of lisa's work the links to her website and social media 
can be found in the description of this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to welcoming you back real soon. Thank you.